Welcome to A Minute or Two with the Word. I'm your host, Torah teacher Ariel, where every few days we take a look at a relevant passage of Scripture together as Jews and Gentiles in Messiah. These days, a growing number of Christians can be found returning to the Hebraic roots of their faith, which usually includes with it a return to following after the Torah of Moshe. But why would anyone wish to return to the Old Covenant? Isn't the Torah the Old Covenant? Take a look at this important passage with me. But their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 14 out of the ESV. What exactly is this verse trying to teach us? Messianic Jewish author Tim Haig of TorahResource.com has these insightful thoughts to add to this chair passage. The Old Covenant is Paul's term for living with the knowledge of Torah, but not receiving it by faith, and therefore missing the very goal of the Torah, who is Yeshua. Paul's Old Covenant is reading the Tanakh with a veil over it so that the glory of Yeshua cannot be seen. The Old Covenant is the Torah without faith, and when the Torah is accepted apart from faith, it comes as a letter of condemnation and death, not the life-giving tree God intends for his elect ones. That's Tim Haig, Spirituality, Are We Better Off Now? From TorahResource.com, 2002, page 2 and 3. Wow! This explanation sounds drastically different than what we're usually taught about Old Covenant versus New Covenant. I think Haig hit the nail on the head. The takeaway for today's short video teaching is this. If you are saved, then the Torah is no longer old to your heart and mind. It has become new by the power of God himself. For those of us in Messiah, the Holy Spirit illuminating Yeshua in the pages of the written letter, drawing us into a saving relationship with him, and then empowering us to become Torah submissive is all part of the experience of what the Torah being written on our hearts means. To be sure, the reality of the Ruach HaKodesh in our lives is what makes this return to our Hebraic roots along with Torah submission possible in the first place. That'll do it for the short little video for tonight. I don't know about you, but I think the theology behind that particular video, again, I don't claim the authorship of the theology. (laughs) I mean, I I produced the video and I put all that together and I wrote it actually. I might have scripted it, except for the the quote from Tim Haig. But the theology behind that, I think, is as powerful um, ramifications for us in the uh, church today, just considering the idea that when Paul is explaining Old Covenant, uh, by the way, which is only used this one time in the entire Bible, this phrase Old and Covenant right here together, these words, palaias um, diatheikes, um, this is the only time in the Bible that we find this phrase Old Covenant. And yet we know he's talking about something that can be read because he says it in the very next verse, whenever Moses is read. So we know that it's linked to Moses in some way. But the, the, the theology behind what Paul's trying to convey, that blindness exists to a person who's trying to read God's words outside of, of um, surrendering to Yeshua, is what equals old covenant or old uh, mindset. We can take that theology and we can apply that to any part of the Bible. And that's the challenge I'm trying to uh, present us with tonight as we move into the next part of our study. If a person tries to open up God's words outside of the help of the Holy Spirit and tries to find Messiah and tries to apply Messiah to his life, again, outside of the regenerative work of Yeshua, outside of surrendering to Messiah, then that person is in a condition that Paul would label Old Covenant or simply unsaved. We don't have to link, we don't have to tie it down to the the, the Torah of Moshe when we're describing this theology. What I mean is this, by that standard, we could take a person, a Christian, in name only, 
a churchgoer, right, a visitor to a church, or someone born into a family that's labeled as Christian, we could take any person who opens the pages of any part of God's Word. This includes the New Testament. You could have a person sitting in a church, reading through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but yet they're unsaved. They don't know Messiah. They don't know Jesus. They don't know the power of the Holy Spirit inside of them. They don't know what it means to be forgiven on the inside. They, they have, their heart has not been regenerated yet. They have not turned to the Lord, to quote Paul's verbiage in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. If they have not turned, if they have not yet turned to the Lord, maybe the Holy Spirit's working on them. That's, that's to be said. But we're talking about they haven't made that profession. They've not come to the point where they've been reborn. The, 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 the regeneration has not take, taken place yet. So they're just still in decision mode. If that's the case, then it doesn't really matter what part of the Bible they're reading. They are Old Covenant. You understand what I mean by that phrase, Old Covenant? It is a phrase denoting a person who is unsaved, yet is reading through God's words, perhaps for the intellectual nutrition, for it, perhaps for the um, just for uh, the sake of, of reading material. We, we don't know what's motivating them to read the Bible, but it doesn't matter. Whatever the case, it doesn't matter what you're reading. If Messiah hasn't opened your eyes yet, then you are Old Covenant. So now, using that theology, we can, we can better understand Paul's terminology here. We don't have to say as Christians that the, that the Torah is the Old Covenant, and therefore the New Testament is the New Covenant somehow, as if he's referring to covenants. It's not necessarily what he's talking about. Although, again, don't get me wrong, he is talking about something that Israel's reading, because he says that in verse 15, whenever Moses is read. So he's talking about something that's being read. But Paul, again, was writing in a time when there wasn't no, uh, there wasn't any um, codified section of the Bible that Christians today called New Testament. Paul was pinning them, right? I mean, Corinthians is going to become part of the canon that we call New Testament. But at the time, he, it was just Paul's letters circulating and the, the sayings of Yeshua that would be, eventually get, get collected as all the Gospels. But once that took place, then we could apply the same logic that Paul's talking about to those letters as well. Anyone reading through any part of the Bible with eyes closed, with eyes shut, they are Old Covenant. That's a better way to understand the passage. Amen? I mean, all right, it's about 20 minutes into the study tonight. Let's turn now to Romans 14, unplug, feasts and fasts and food. Oh my, we're working our way down through a commentary that I wrote on this particular um, passage. And we're just now making our way to the conclusions. Let's start going. What have we learned by perusing differing Christian and Messianic perspectives on the identity of the weak and strong? Remember, we're working from a comparison between two positions on this particular chapter. The traditional, historic, Christian uh, interpretation of Romans chapter 14 and the weak in faith is that the weak in faith are Christians, predominantly Jewish Christians, but Christians nonetheless, who are weak Perhaps they're new believers, but their weakness is directly tied to the fact that they are still, even though they believe in Jesus, they are still practicing parts of, particularly ceremonial parts of the Torah. This would be Sabbath keeping, kosher keeping, festival keeping, things like that. So their weakness is tied in the, in the minds of Christian theologians down through history. The weakness of these Jewish Christians is directly connected to these Jewish Christians' preference for continuing to walk in Torah. This has huge implications for the way that traditional Christians of today view and interpret Messianic Jewish expressions of um Bible keeping today. So if you ask your average Christian today, what do you think about the messing of Judaism, if they even know what it is, then your average Christian will will share some thoughts, sim- something along these lines. I'm being very overly broad and generic in my descriptions. But generally speaking, your average Christian might say something to the effect of, well, yeah, I've heard of those messing of Jews. Um, they, they claim to believe in Jesus, and that's good, but they still keep Torah, which is really kind of makes me feel uncomfortable as a, as a Gentile Christian because we all know that the law has been done away with. It's been relaxed in Jesus. It's been set aside by the blood of Messiah. And Paul teaches that we're no longer under the law, but under grace. And so it's it's unfortunate that those Messianic Jews can't seem to let go of that old dispensation, that old um, expression of, of, of walking in God because it's been done away with. It's been fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled it, so we don't have to do it anymore. 
But nevertheless, I am thankful that they have claimed that they've come to an understanding of Jesus. And so uh, prayerfully in their walk as they grow, uh, just like the rest of us Christians, the rest of us in the church, as these Messianic uh, Jews, as they grow in their walk with Jesus, that they'll prayerfully come to a place where the Holy Spirit can show them that they no longer need to be tied down to that, but that they are free from the law, they have a freedom in, in Christ, and that the only law they need to concern themselves with is the law of Christ, not the law of Moses. So those are kind of traditional Christian sentiments when it comes to looking at this passage in Romans 14. I take a position that's opposite that somewhat. Um, I don't think the weak in faith are Gentile, Jewish and Gentile Christians, particularly Jewish Christians. I, in fact, take the position that Mark Nanos is championing in his book. He's not the only one championing it, but he's the more vocal one and the more recognized one holding this position today. And that is that the weak in faith are actually unbelieving Jews who are still recognized by Paul as part of the greater, larger community of um, faithful uh, and loyal to God, loyal to God's Torah, but not yet decided that Jesus is the Messiah. So Paul can recognize them as brothers, and he can recognize them as fellow covenant members, but he realizes that their understanding of the scope of God's covenants and promises is still kind of stunted. It's limited. It's not yet reached its fullest um, um uh, matriculation of faith. And so Paul is also prayerful and hopeful that these unbelieving Jews would come to knowledge of Yeshua, and indeed he's appealing to the Gentile believers in his in his letter to continue to reach out to the unbelieving Jews as they stumble over the stone known as Messiah. Reference uh, Romans chapters 9, 10, and 11. So if the weak in faith are unbelieving Jews, then their preference for keeping Torah is stems from a loyalty to Torah that God enjoins upon Israel from days gone by. And therefore, their position on, on Torah is not wrong. We simply need to pray that they will be brought into an understanding of Messiah and eventually confess Yeshua. As long as they're not hostile, as long as they're open to that, that's the position I'm working with. And I think that position has a context based on the previous chapters in Romans, particularly going all the way back to chapter 1, and then we can jump forward to chapter 4 with Abraham, and then we can fast forward up to chapter 5, um, and then we can also look at chapters 9, 10, and 11, culminating in chapters 14 and 15, where Paul actually says, weak in faith. Okay, so let's keep reading. So what we discovered in this particular commentary is that mainstream Christian perspectives on the identity of the weak and the strong are heavily influenced by the historic Christian bias that can rightfully be described as a law-free gospel. And that's a term that you're going to find in many commentaries and books if, you, if you're able to peruse through Christian commentaries on your own. If not, just Google search the phrase law-free gospel. And that's a term that basically describes the historic Christian Gentile position that Paul taught Gentiles that they no longer need to keep Sabbath and kosher, the things that are that are uh, ostensibly mentioned in Romans 14. You know, one man considers one day special, another man considers all days alike. Perhaps Paul's talking about the Sabbath, according to some in, in, interpreters, things like that, commentators. Um, and then Paul goes on in that same, in the same chapter of Romans 14 to talk about um, you know, eating and drinking and wine and, and, and what is the clean and what's unclean and things like that. So it, it's easily a discussion about holiness issues or, or or, or uh, uh, issues that would be important to the social communities of Paul's day, Jew and Gentile, religious and non-religious, things like that. So, law-free gospel. That's what most Christians believe Paul to be presenting to the Gentiles, is a gospel that is broken free from its ba uh, boundaries of, of being tied down to the mosaic dispensation of whatever you want to call that. So, I continue. In this view, right, that we're still talking about the traditional Christian view. The weak and strong are two groups of people in the church, both of whom are Christian, right? They're both believers, and yet one feels a compulsion to keep the law of Moses, which is, would be the weak, which would be the Messianic Jews that I described earlier, and one feels no sub such compulsion, that is the strong, aka the Gentile Christians, which in Paul's day, again, this is traditional Christian perspective, in Paul's day would have been the Gentiles who were brought into an, an understanding of Messiah without having to undergo any conversion policy to Judaism or undergo any return to a law of Moses in their perspective 
have any 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 ties to um, being identified with physical Israel uh, from an ethnic perspective. That was this is again the perspective that most Christian commentators are going to take when they read this particular part of the Bible. So let's keep reading my own commentary. So this is the weak and the strong, according to Christian exegesis. Weak, believing Jews. But weak in that they're still keeping Torah. We could, of course, include Gentiles in that description if we want to. But primarily, when I read through Christian commentators, most of them identify the weak Christians or the weak brothers, the weak in faith, as weak Messianic Jews. And again, if those Messianic Jews were weak 2,000 years ago, well, then it's an easy connection to make the assumption that Messianic Jews of the 21st century are also weak if they are still holding on to vestiges of Torah. You understand the, the, the jump from the first century interpretation to the 21st century application. This is why it's a little bit disturbing to me as a Messianic Jew, because um, when I have dialogue with well-meaning Christian friends and family, um, Gentile Christians who hold this perspective that I'm describing, and when they find out that I, as a Messianic Jew, actually continue to walk in ceremonial parts of Torah, like Sabbath and kosher, well then, a look comes over their face as if to say, wow, I wonder if this Messianic Jew still, real. I wonder if this Messianic Jew realizes that he's putting himself in a position of being a weak believer, and then he really should have grown in faith. How long has he been a believer? One year, two years, five years, ten years? Why hasn't he grown strong so that he can realize that he no longer has to walk in the Torah of Moses? He doesn't have to keep that anymore. He's, he should be strong right now like me, like the, the rest of us strong Gentile Christians. So that's, that's where we're going with this discussion. I'm not saying that they judge, that, that, this, that this Christian is judging me. Although in Paul's day, the two groups were judging one another, and Paul's definitely going to hit on that. So let's keep reading my commentary. According to this view, again, the, the prevailing Christian perspective, Paul, one of the non-compulsive strong, must caution these two groups to avoid passing judgment on one another since each must be fully convinced in his own mind. Again, this is a central piece of the passage and we need to highlight that as to what is the right lifestyle to lead as a Christian. So we got judgment taking place from group A to group B and back and forth. The Christian Gentiles are judging the Messianic Jews for still keeping Torah and the Messianic Jews are judging the Gentile Christians for quite just the opposite, for not keeping Torah or things like that. So um, let's let's go with that definite with that explanation for a moment. I go on to say, what is more, in this view, since it is assumed that Paul must have also abandoned compulsion towards at least the ceremonial aspects of the Torah when he came to faith in Yeshua, then it only follows that he would obviously side with the strong that the weak should not remain in their weakness, but instead in time should join the walk of the strong, where instead of focusing on special days and select food and drink, all who are strong can declare like Paul, quote, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit, end quote. And of course, that's a quote from Romans 14 itself. Paul, those are Paul's words. And so it's easy to see in the traditional Christian perspective, how in their explanation about the strong and the weak, Paul himself says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. And we go from that explanation, of what Paul says, to an articulation in today's Christian um, dialogues between Jews and Christians and Messianics about the relevance of Torah, uh, the relevancy of Torah in our lives and things like that. We have the traditional Christian voice uh um, writing on top of Paul's explanation there, that last uh, um, uh, phrase, and we have a traditional Christian pastor saying to we Messianic Jews, see, Paul thinks that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, so why are you Messianic Jews making a big deal about what's kosher and what's not? Why are you highlighting clean and unclean foods? What's that? You know, that's that's not even a big deal anymore. And Paul says the kingdom of God's not a matter of eating and drinking. That's not what's important. To Paul, what's important is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. You Messianics got, have got your priorities wrong. You're focusing and you're highlighting uh, what to Paul has become a side issue or an, a non-issue at all, right? Paul, to Paul doesn't think eating and drinking is important at all. He says it's not, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. So 
Why are you messing a Jew still making a deal of that? You understand how that theology leads to this particular discussion from traditional messianic, uh, traditional Christian perspectives. So that's what we're looking at when we're uh, talking about this particular passage. Let me read this one uh, last paragraph here, and then I think I'll uh, uh, jump into the segment two. These are my own thoughts. I go on to say, indeed, if according to traditional Gentile Christianity, Paul abandoned his Torah-keeping stance. Um, give me a second here. My phone is doing something funny. There we go. <clears throat> Let's try that again. Indeed, if according to traditional Christian Gentile Christianity, Paul abandoned his Torah-keeping stance in favor of becoming quote, all things to all men, end quote, right? Re- reference 1 Corinthians 9, 19 to 23. A position that, in my opinion, as a Messianic Jewish believer in Yeshua, suspiciously seems to always default back into some semblance of a Torahless, non-Jewish form of Gentile Christianity. You ever, you ever notice that? If you go back and look at that particular passage where Paul says, I've become all things to all men. And for some reason, the default of all things to all men seems to somehow default into making Paul look like a Gentile Christian, where all things means, I be. in other words, it's almost as Paul saying, I've become a Gentile to all Gentiles, something to that effect, when in reality, all, all things, all men must also include all Jews who are religious, but we're, we're not here to talk about that passage for now, but again, that's that's just my, my sentimentality, but let's continue. So, um, if indeed um, uh, Paul uh, has abandoned his Torah keeping stance in favor of becoming all things all men, then, it, I mean, if, if that's true, which I don't believe he did, right? I do not, as a Messianic Jew, believe that Paul abandoned his Torah pe- keeping stance in favor of, of this kind of law free gospel. I, I, I flatly reject that. I categorically reject that, that um, position. But if it were true, then it naturally follows that he would not wish to have strong, quote unquote, Christian community members at Rome be they Jewish or Gentile, he wouldn't want these strong Christians retaining any loyalty to ceremonial aspects of the ostensibly canceled, the supposedly canceled law of Moses, right? Am I right? If Paul really was teaching a law-free gospel, if Paul really did teach believers, both Jew and Gentile, that we're free from the law of Moses, that we no longer have to concern ourselves with the, the, the Sabbath, the food laws, and that all of that is a, a bygone dispensation, it's all been replaced in, by the law of Messiah, and that we no longer have to worry about any of that anymore, the law really truly has been, quote-unquote, done away with or fulfilled, and that uh, we're in a new dispensation of grace and things like that. If that's the case, then he would certainly be concerned uh Rightfully so, if Gentile Christians are still clamoring after Torah or gravitating towards Sabbaths and things like that, right? He wouldn't want them to retain any such loyalty. I go on to say, in such a scenario, such law-keeping Jews and Gentiles must be, quote, weak in faith as evidenced by their continuing dependency upon shadows, right? The law is a shadow instead of relying fully upon the finished work of Messiah, which of course is the body who's casting those shadows in the first place. So we can see in closing to segment one tonight that the the traditional Christian position has some answers, I'm sorry, has some explaining to do when it comes to uh, articulating this particular position. I'm not simply picking on the church for no reason. Don't get don't get me wrong. Don't misunderstand me. We're we're in this together as Jews and Gentiles, as Christians and Jews, working our way through these biblical topics. And I'm not claiming that I have all the answers. And I'm not just pointing my bony Jewish finger at the Gentile Christians and saying, "You guys really missed it." I'm not judging you for your interpretations of these passages. What I am trying to do is say, let's sit down with the Word of God together. Let's look at all the pieces involved, everything from Genesis to maps, and let's put the data on the table, and let's see if we can come to a better understanding, an understanding that serves both Jews and Gentiles in Messiah and helps Jews who are not in Messiah yet to come to a proper understanding of how does Torah fit in to a lifestyle that is predominantly uh, governed by faith in Messiah? How can I as a Jew come to faith in Jesus and still retain my loyalty to Torah, if at all? Okay, Those are some of the questions that we need better answers to. History hasn't really given us the best answers, but thankfully we're coming to a place more and more where Jews and Gentiles are dialoguing together with one another over these particular difficult topics, and we're coming to some better answers. Okay, Baruch Hashem, that's, that's good news.